the end of debate, um, there are many ways I, I, of coming at this, and I suppose you would expect me to talk a great deal about the media. I hope I don't. I, I mean, I, I don't really. I think we've moved beyond that point. I think what, what we need to understand, I mean, it's obvious what's happening with the media. Uh, I'll go a little bit into that, but it's pretty obvious what it is. And um, uh, I think we need to look to the next stage to actually identify what the media are doing to us and um, to our society and to our uh, rights and our uh, children's rights. Um, when, I, when I came to Dublin first, uh, uh, back in the mid-80s, um, with great hopes of being a journalist, uh, you know, I, I, if you'd asked me then what it would have been like to work in a newspaper like the Irish Times, I would have given you a, I would have painted a picture of, you know, uh, going around this building talking to people with all kinds of different views, you know, running into each other on the stairs, you know, uh, having arguments, disagreeing with points here and there, um, over coffees and so on in the canteen, um, a vibrant kind of discussion about everything. That's what I would have imagined the newspaper was. What I encountered was the direct opposite in the Irish Times. Uh, Having brought me in, as it were, because I was different. I mean, the editor who brought me in, Conor Brady, actually said, I don't want you coming in and being like everybody else in here. But he's, he had failed to make, take the precaution of telling everybody else <laughs> that this was his intention in bringing me in because they all hated me from the word go uh, because I didn't agree with them about everything. I thought that's what made me worthwhile as a, as a journalist. Uh, they thought of what made me unspeakable as a journalist or as a human being. In fact, more so as a human being. Now, that very quickly, one gathered that this was not simply a failure to have the correct viewpoint. It was to be morally deficient in, very, in, in different ways. Um, and I'm talking now, not I'm talking about the kind of issues that perhaps we might infer to be our, our agenda for this evening. And I want to come back to that because it's not as simple as it, as it might seem. But these will be kind of mainstream issues, like uh, the, uh, what was happening to the countryside, what was happening to sub-post offices, uh, Fianna Fáil, uh, the kind of idea that, you know, because somebody was in a particular party, uh, they were equally morally deficient by definition, uh, which was, as somebody who kind of came from the other side of the tracks, began to seem to me to be increasingly strange, and I said so, and this again made me as morally deficient as anybody in Fianna Fáil. Um, that was really the beginning of, of uh, an education. Uh, going right down to the years there, I was 24 years in the Irish Times, and in five or six years in, I became involved in a particular discussion which I had generated myself in relation to family courts and the treatment of fathers. And, you know, I had come from a left liberal kind of position, really, in the west of Ireland, if you can be left liberal in the west of Ireland. I suppose you can now, uh, almost. <laughs> Not in Roscommon, but other counties. Um, um, uh, and I was really of the view that, uh, you know, I was there to, to uh, uh, at that point, to advance what I thought in a kind of a woolly way were human rights issues and so on. And I had, I had edited magazines like in Dublin and McGill, and nobody had noticed anything wrong with me in those positions, uh, uh, as it were. And um, I had kind of formed the view that, uh, uh, you know, I was a left-wing person. I remember actually Václav Havel once uh, asking, answering that question, he was asked, because of the kind of paradoxical state of his position in, in Czechoslovakia, he was asked, you know, wh what are your politics? Uh, you know, are you, are you left-wing or right-wing? And he, he gave a very beautiful answer. He said, my heart is on the left. And I would have said that my heart is on the left as well. Uh, and then, uh, just to shorten this story, uh, when I, in the mid-90s, stumbled across this, what I thought was an absolutely uh, bang to rights case of injustice and uh, what I thought was a cultural oversight at first, was that was the maltreatment of fathers in our legal system, particularly single fathers, but also divorced fathers, separated fathers, that notwithstanding the big fuss that liberals had made about introducing divorce, they seemed to have overlooked 
the consequences for one half of the parties involved. And so I started to draw attention to this. And uh, as it were, I've, I've written about this in this way that, and it's, of course it's somewhat metaphorical, but I say that, you know, when I discovered this injustice, my first thought was to run back to my erstwhile uh, compadres on the left, uh, my fellow journalists who had championed various human rights causes through the years. And I said to them, come quickly, come quickly, you'll never guess what I'm after discovery. Uh, this is a terrible injustice, you're going to be absolutely outraged by it. And um, so I did that and, and they tried to kick my head in. And they've been kicking it in ever since. And I didn't realise then, I thought it was personal. It took me a long time to see that this was part of an agenda, that I had actually tripped a wire in a long-term plan a little bit too soon before it could be exposed. And that's really what I, why I got my head kicked in and have been getting my head kicked in ever since. For me, that, that had a, quite an educative uh, impact on me because suddenly I, I, it occurred to me that I'd been wrong about a lot of these people and I'd been wrong about certain of the issues that they were advocating. And I kind of figured that if I'm wrong about these things, the chances are that I'm, I may be wrong about a lot of other things as well. So I started to go back to the beginning. And that's how I ended up being regarded as a Catholic writer, because I actually found myself going back to read uh, Ratzinger and, and John Paul II and so on, and finding that it is a bit like Mark Twain, that they had learned a lot in the years in which I'd been away. <laughs> and um, so that's, uh, so then my, uh, the danger then that happened, and what happened to me for a while, and I, I acquiesced in this, and it's a dangerous role, is that you become a token reactionary. You, 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 fill, you fulfill their need to show to the world that they are indeed, as they say, liberal. So they have you in there and they, in order to be able to say to people, well, you can't accuse us of being illiberal because we have that idiot uh, writing every week. Come on. And that was kind of my function in the Irish Times. I mean, I once did it in an interview, I said it in an interview uh, in, it, with a student in Portugal who was doing a thesis on the Irish Times. I said, my job in the Irish Times is to be wrong about everything. <laughs> Which I think I did very well, in, in all modesty. <laughs> uh, and signs is on me, I'm no longer there. Uh, uh, so, uh, that's kind of the beginning, just a personal note. Um, when we talk about the end of debate, though, we're not really just talking about media. We're talking about something much deeper. We're talking about, because the, 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 the media are quite an anomalous entity in our culture, in our society. They're bulwark of our democracy, the fourth state, with government and parliament and the legal system, the judiciary. They are a fundamental pillar of our uh, democratic freedoms. But the anomaly is that they are in almost invariably privately owned and run. So that unlike the other pillars, they don't have a public dimension. And they're not bound by the kind of, kind of uh, principles of constitutionality and, and state uh, protection that applies in the other cases. They're quite different, quite anomalous. And one of the things is that we, we tend to forget this because we have actually allowed our media to go into a free market situation without any cognizance of this function that they fulfil or without any real oversight. Or at least with oversight that is deficient. And I have to speak a little bit about that because I was for 10 years on the regulatory bodies to do with broadcasting in Ireland. And then it, at the end of that period, I have to say that we failed miserably uh, to do what we were there to do, which was to protect the public interest. Um, uh, as evidenced by the referendum last year where we had a presenter from a radio program who was uh, in, uh, during the day presiding over debates supposedly impartially uh, and then um, at night he was campaigning for a yes vote uh, and the regulator, the official regulator was unable to do anything about it if indeed the official regulator, regulator even wanted to do anything about it which I was unable to discern. The me beyond that then there is what happens to our society, what happens to us. And I think that one cannot be too pessimistic or, or dismal in the way one analyzes or pronounces on the situation as it pertains now. Um, because effectively we have a society without the, the capacity for a fair 
an even-handed conversation about anything worthwhile. Um, we have a, a, a society which is in free fall, um, intellectually, psychologically, spiritually, morally, and to actually put yourself against the run of play is to announce yourself as a bad person. That's the way it's set up. I noticed this first going back years ago that when I was still a left winger, or when I was still thought to be a left winger, uh, the, the nature of panel discussions on various programmes um, would be approximately that they would have, for statutory reasons, an even split more or less uh, in superficial terms between yeah, those who had one point of view and those who had another. But what I found was watching this, that the way these were chosen, that on one side, the side which was approved, the voices were invariably those of um, people who were regarded as good thinking, right thinking people. Invariably, what they sought to put on the other side were people who were set up to lose the arguments uh, by virtue of representing a view which could easily be disposed of on the basis of, for example, being Catholic just to give one example. And I want to come back to this because it's very important that we deal with this question for ourselves. What the role of our faith, those of us who are Catholics, and we don't have to be Catholic, and this is the point really, we don't have to be anything, religiously speaking, to have a particular view of these matters and to have the same view of these matters. But, so the, the way I describe it is that at a certain point uh, in the debate, there was to be a person always in each panel who you might say was manifestly wrong. And the idea was then that this person would become ritually defeated in the discussion that ensued. This was the purpose. It, so it was not a debate ever, it was a drama. And this guy was, just as in the uh, spaghetti westerns, you always knew the bad guys because they had moustaches and laughed too much. <laughs> you always knew the Catholics on the panel because they said certain things in certain language and they usually had dandruff. <laughs> uh, this was a prerequisite. Absolutely, absolutely essential if you wanted to get onto panels in RTE uh, to have, wear a dark jacket and have dandruff. Um, during the years, I, 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 as I say, I want to move on to, but I, I noticed many things in relation to uh, the way that media operated the way that, for example, letters pages operated. You, I, I always thought that they were naturalistic, spontaneous reflections of the kind of letters that would come in. I very soon found out that this was not the case. That, you know, because very often, if I was in a particular spat, people who had, not, had been unsuccessful in having letters published would send them on to me. And of course, I would have them. And then I would get the denial from the letters editor that any such letters had come in. So that kind of thing was kind of routine. But there's, there are deeper things. There's, you see, people actually think that for this to happen, that there needs to be a conspiracy, that there needs to be a room full of people deciding certain things. But there's a deep, deep culture at work here, which works off the idea that most of us like to be liked. We like to be approved of. And if you think of the dynamics of a newsroom, Unless you're a very hard-nosed person, you cannot go in every day to meetings and take a particular line against everybody and have everybody excoriate you and distance themselves from you. It's very difficult to function like that. So what you actually find over time in journalism is that the corners are knocked off you um, in different ways. I remember when I went into the Irish Times first, I, um, I was taken in uh, straight from... Um, uh, in Dublin, and the editor made clear, as I said, that he wanted me to write like in Dublin and Hot Press, which I'd been with before. And he didn't want me writing like uh, the rest of the crowd in there, and he, he wasn't all that flattering about them. I don't know why. Um, but my first, first assignment was to go to the Midland Town, Midland Towns, there were four Midland Towns, which unfortunately for the editor included also one of his, his own hometown, uh, Tullamore. And, um, the, the task was to actually write truthfully about what I found in these towns. 
and write about them in the way that I might have written about them for Hot Press or in Dublin. So I took the editor at his word and wrote four articles and immediately like the whole place went ballistic. They were special sittings of Joe Duffy. Uh, <laughs> um, county councils issued uh, excoriations and announcements. And uh, at the end of it, I noticed a change in the, action, the, reaction, the, the response to me within the Irish Times, officially. Because up to that, I was treated, I, I sent in my article, this was before email, and it was maybe mildly edited for whatever reasons, uh, purely to do with space or grammar or syntax, whatever it would be, nothing to do with what you might even remotely think of as censorship. But I remember then, immediately, a process started where a senior editor in the editor's office would start to call me up whenever I submitted an article and say, yes, John, now, uh, we have your article here and it's, it's really, really good. Uh, we, we really like it. But there's just a few queries we have. So they would start at the first sentence and they would go and they would say, well, you know, how do you know that, really? Who told you that? Are you sure about that? Have you evidence for that? Maybe there's a different way you could put that, just to be, protect yourself a little bit. And then we would move on to sentence two and so on and so forth. And this would go on, every sentence. It would take two hours, two and a half hours on the phone each time. And this went on for weeks and weeks, possibly months, until one day it stopped. And it didn't happen then again. And I was thinking, wow, that, they just got off my case. Isn't that amazing? You know, they've moved on to somebody else. But then a second thought occurred to me. I'm now doing to myself what they want to do to me. I'm, I've now fitted in. So this is how it begins to work. So you're told as an official, there's an, you're, you're, it is intimated to you that there's a particular correct way of looking at things. And when an editor in the, I used to write, when I, at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, which I opposed, um, a senior editor said to me, you know, and he wasn't joking, he said, not too long ago we used to have corporal punishment here for people like you. <laughs> and he, was, he was, wasn't quite joking. Um, so you, you kind of get to see that there's a way of being and this is an approved way and there's ways of communicating this to people. So it's not the idea that there's a kind of conspiracy. I think we need to be more mindful of what it is, what there's something deeper. We don't have journalism. We don't have a media in any meaningful sense of the word. We have something else. We don't have a fourth estate. We have something else. We have something deeply corrupt at every level. And I want to come now to what happened last year because I think this illustrates the case very graphically. Uh, as David Quinn said to me, you know, it's like the debate as such, if you can use that word, was like if there's a football match and you invite one of the teams on three hours before the game starts and you allow them to score as many goals as they can. <laughs> and then you bring on the other team and every time they touch the ball, the, whistle, the, the referee blows the whistle. <laughs> that was our debate. Now, um, this is what's important. It's only afterwards when I started to go back into it and, and I realised certain things. First of all, I realised we were trying to make reasonable arguments to do with the Constitution and so forth. Waste of time. Complete folly. This was a, a debate which was engineered around the idea of emotions. Uh, simplistic emotions, facile emotions, uh, easily manipulated emotions. By making reasonable arguments, we were actually defeating our own arguments because you seem to be coldly, dispassionately arguing about legalities when what we were told was, well, love was the issue. So that was the first thing that I think needs to be said about that. Second thing I, I realised afterwards that there's a word that's at the core of all of this that we need to focus on. And that word is propaganda. And I, I don't, um, I think maybe for the next few minutes, I want to just maybe open up the possibility that we start to think again about propaganda. Because I think we may have forgotten what propaganda really is. 
you know, I, I think that, that that's one of the things that this debate so-called shows us, that we actually have no idea what propaganda actually is anymore. Even though we'll throw the word around, we'll bandy it around in different contexts, mm -hmm. we can easily talk about Goebbels and propaganda, but that's acquired a certain cartoon aspect that doesn't seem to be real. Even Nazism, in a general sense, it seemed to be somehow an aberration from uh, the history of the Western world. And so as a result, we don't actually focus on the possibilities that propaganda really offers. Because propaganda isn't really just a kind of uh, a relentless form of, of uh, advertising. It's something much deeper. It, 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 it goes to the very heart of how people think and what they think. You see, there was, there's, there's a way of stating what happened. One of the emotional arguments was that there was a comparison to be made between the blacks' struggle for human rights in the United States and the struggle of LGBT people for marriage. A completely spurious argument, but the kind of argument that seemed to have traction in that kind of emotive discussion that was being facilitated by the media. Now, for 20 years, I would say now, I advocated a particular human right in the Irish Times, in the pages of the Irish Times. You might agree with me, you might disagree with me, but nevertheless, when you go back to the archives of the Irish Times, you will find countless articles by me talking about fathers and fatherhood, children, dozens, maybe hundreds. In fact, I was accused of writing far too many of them. You won't find anything like that in relation to gay marriage in the Irish Times archive. You will find a handful of articles. One, you know, a friend of mine wrote an article, he's dead now, uh, Jerry McNamara wrote a fine article in 1995. Um, I say fine as a piece of writing and as a piece of logic and, and reason. But this is an amazing thing, that in all the liberal newspapers of the Western world, including the ones in Ireland, but The Guardian in England, the, the New York Times, La Repubblica in Italy, you might expect from the way they dealt with the referendum that they had been campaigning for gay marriage for hundreds of years. No. Maybe hundreds of days. But that's all. There is no record, there is no track record. The colonists who were excoriating their enemies on the basis of their bigotry had not written the articles that one would have inferred to exist. This is a strange kind of human right that suddenly erupts in time and space without any warning, without any trace, any paper trail. Um, it's a very beautiful uh, quote which I'd like to read on this subject by the dis one of the dissenting judges in the American Supreme Court case last uh, year, Antonio Scalia. He was excoriating the rest of the, the majority of the court for their decision. And, and really he nailed this, the absurdity and the bizarre nature of the logic. What really astounds, he said, is the hubris reflected in today's judicial putsch. The five justices who compose today's majority are entirely comfortable concluding that every state violated the Constitution for all of the 135 years between the 14th Amendment's ratification and Massachusetts' permission, permitting of same-sex marriage in 2003. They have discovered in the 14th Amendment a fundamental right overlooked by every person alive at the time of ratification and almost everyone else in the time since. That kind of gets what I'm talking about. There's something so bizarre here. And there are many bizarre things, but the reason you don't hear about them as bizarre things is because we have a corrupt media. We don't hear about anything that isn't. So the media are campaigners. They're no longer journalists. Propaganda. I'll just read a few things about this because I think we, we, there are many books about the, on this subject and I started to read a few of them in the last year. Again, some of them I'd read before but not well enough, clearly. Um, not closely enough. Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, wrote in a, a book in 1928 called Propaganda. Um, and he talked about the idea of the public, the people, handing over 
because things are so complicated, there's so much thing, so much detail in, in life now, even then, that we hand, he said, the, the process over to what he called the, the process of sifting and deciding to what he called the invisible government, which essentially tells us what things mean, which things are important, and what our options are in considering them. And by and large, we accept the verdicts provided to us by our media and political elites. Um, and he said, the most important thing about propaganda is that it be universal and continuous, hammering home the same message by diverse means again and again. The purpose is to regiment this mind of a society in the same way as an army drills its soldiers. Propaganda is most effective in the hands of what he called intelligent minorities. He didn't mean in that sense the kind of minorities we have now, victim groups. What he meant was intellectual elites seeking to guide society in particular directions. And Bernays referred to these intellectual elite, elites without any irony as dictators. Telling word. Um, this is what we have now, a dictatorship. A dictatorship, as Ratzinger said, of tolerance. A dictatorship which insists that it is doing what it is doing in the name of tolerance and compassion and love and equality, but is actually destroying the civilization on which it stands. Um, Bernays co-opted the work of a, of a French philosopher from some time before, 100 years or so before, Gustave Le Bon, who was the first really in, in public intellectual life at least to identify the idea of a group mind as having entirely different characteristics to the individual mind. The group mind, he says, does not think, at least not in the conventional sense of the word, and yet it acts as if it had an intelligence all of its own. In place of thought, thought he said, it has impulses, habits and emotions. In making up its mind, its first impulse is to follow the example of a trusted leader. But when the example of the leader is not at hand, and the herd must think for itself, it does so by means of clichés, pat words or images which stand for a whole group of ideas or experience. That, that's essentially what happened. That, that we are subjected, because in the most mass media world we now live in, without even thinking about it, we have a radio set on. We think well, it's just background noise. You may hear an item, you may tune in, you think. But all the time, this process is actually cleansing your m mind of independent thought. This is the most important thing. Even when you're not listening, your mind is being purged of any thought of its own, making it ripe for the time when you do tune in to be told what to think, what position to take, what is the right position. I would say that this is something we should be teaching our children in schools, but of course that would be a ridiculous thing to say now because they've already got to the schools. The schools are in the control of all of this thinking already. Um, a Frenchman, Jackie Lull, in 1965, wrote another book called Propagandas. And he talked about propaganda as a direct attack against man. Um, he said that propaganda rendered the exercise of democracy almost impossible. This is why those who persist in thinking for themselves or even expressing unapproved views invite such a probrium in modern societies. It's not just that they threaten the reach or influence of the propagandists. It is that by their very presence they put at risk the whole edifice. Their descent endangers the artifice that is essential for effective propaganda. And that, that includes the sense of naturalism factuality that accompanies it. In other words, it's very important with propaganda that it appears to be simply factual. That it is, the language, that's why they use language in a certain way. You know, the concept that they place those emphasis on changing the meanings of things before they present them to people. So gay marriage ceases to be gay marriage, it becomes marriage equality. And who could be opposed to equality? Um, and so on. And so Elul said, once successfully propagandized, the individual ceases to be a passive recipient of the propaganda and becomes an evangelist. He takes vigorous stances, starts to oppose others. He asserts himself at the very moment that he denies his own self without realizing it. To submit to propaganda, therefore, means to become alienated from oneself. Propaganda strips the individual, robs him of part of himself, and makes him live an alien and artificial life. 
to such an extent that he becomes another person and obeys impulses foreign to him. This is achieved by suffusing the individual in the emotions and responses of the herd, dissipating his individuality, freeing his ego of all confusions, unresolved contradictions and personal reservations. It pushes the individual into the mass until he disappears entirely. What disappears, in fact, is the individual's capacity for personal reflection, independent thinking, critical judgment, these being replaced with ready-made thoughts, stereotypes and cliches. So, crudely, what you can see is that, in a, in a sense, every day, we have this wash of nonsense, which is sweeping through the minds of the population, cleansing them of any independent capacity for reflection. And then that is followed by a second wave, which fills them with whatever the regime requires them to know. And that's essentially, the, that's the setting in which what happened last year happened, and how we got from something that had never been thought of, conceived of, as a human right. You know, it's almost in the same category. I, I called up a senior person in the BI and asked them how it was possible. I'd been on the board of the BI, and we'd spent a lot of time talking about um, how we policed uh, the views of presenters in on air in relation to interviews and so on, how we prevented them from uh, imposing their own slant on an interview. Weeks, months were spent on this endeavour. So I rang a senior person that I'd been involved with and asked him, how is it then possible that one of these presenters is actually able to get up on a platform and advocate a yes vote and go back the next day to conducting interviews? He says, there's, there's nothing in the code about that, John. And the reason there's nothing in the quote about that is because it never occurred to us in our wildest nightmares that anybody might even try to do this. Because we thought journalists are into objective by definition. They do their best. That's how naive we can become in a society where you actually don't even think of the worst scenario because it seems so implausible. And that happens in relation to other aspects of this as well. Um, what we're dealing with here is not, as I said, a spontaneous eruption of a human right. It is actually the cutting edge of a wave of propaganda and ideology, which has, which has been cutting away at our societies, unbeknownst to us, for many decades. We had a fairly radical cut back in 2012 with the introduction of the so-called Children's Rights Amendment, which completely defenestrated the rights of families to protect their children in certain ways. And we saw that in recent times with the uh, way that, that those grandparents were treated in relation to their grandson, where summarily and arbitrarily social workers descended upon them and took the child away because the grandparents were too old. They were in their mid-60s. <laughs> but this is, now, this is now protected by the Constitution. This is now protected by the Constitution. This is what we were talking about. Um, uh, with Cathy, Cathy Senators, with us here tonight, and, and Jerry Fahey, I'm involved in an organisation called First Families First. We issued a press release about that, and like other press releases we've released, we've, to which actually point to the pattern now to be seen, it wasn't published, it wasn't referred to in any of the newspapers. Corruption, pure and simple. This goes back, just very briefly, it's, this is, there's, a, there's a name for all this. It's called culture Marxism. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the term. I, don't, I think it's too limited because it goes back to the Frankfurt School, which was this, a group which started in Frankfurt in the 1920s and then moved to New York. A group of very brilliant Jewish intellectuals. And, and I, I think it's important to, again, talking about conspiracies, that it's not that there's a conspiracy. So we, there's no point in you know, targeting these men and, their, and the memory of these men and saying these are responsible. These are brilliant guys talking about deconstructing literature and so on and, and culture. And I'm all for anything that involves a discussion. The problem is the way that a lot of their thinking has now been interpreted and implied, applied culturally. And one of the ideas that, that this school was really big on was the idea that Marxism had failed in China and, and in, in the Soviet Union for a simple reason that the proletariat had failed to step into its historically all allocated rule, role uh, because basically the proletariat wanted just to have bigger houses and, and more money <laughs> and wasn't really interested in inheriting the earth. So they were stuck for a, a kind of a, a protagonist 
for the socialist revolution. And the task that the Frankfurt School, or one of the tasks the Frankfurt School set themselves was to establish, identify and develop an alternative proletariat. And this they found in what we now call, can see recognisably as the victim classes and the victim ideologies that have sprung up around that, from feminism going on LGBT and so on. Trans is the latest one. And these are now being fed intravenously into our culture via the media in the quite most explicit and unashamed and unabashed way. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. I would say, if you went back again, uh, in the same spirit, I would say there were no articles about gay marriage up to maybe 2012, 2013. There were no articles about trans until after the gay referendum. None. Never mentioned. And then suddenly there were virtually articles every day. I just want to tell you one article which kind of speaks for them all. It's an article in the Irish Independent about last October. And it concerned a man of 43 years of age in Canada who had left his family, several children and wife, because he had decided that he was no longer a man. In fact, he decided he was no longer an adult. He was, in fact, a six-year-old girl. And he had found another family in Canada, grandparents, ironically, and their granddaughter. Uh, I don't know what age they were. Um, uh, but I don't think it would have mattered in this particular context, because you'll see why. Um, and they had decided that it was OK for him to be adopted by them and to be the best friend of their seven-year-old granddaughter. And there was a video accompanying the article in the Irish Independent, in, on the web online edition, which had this individual sitting beside, on a sofa beside this seven-year-old girl. And he was dressed in a red dress and a wig. He, he had shaved for the occasion, appropriately enough. And he was interviewed talking about his best friend, this girl. But here's the thing. Throughout the Irish Independent article, this individual was referred to as she. This is the key to it. This is the key to it. Something radical and unbelievable is happening to our culture, and we are seemingly powerless to stop it. I do want to say this before I stop, because that's the point I was referring to at the beginning. Catholic. Catholic. You see, if this event was reported on in the Irish Times or the Irish Independent tomorrow, the word Catholic would be guaranteed to appear in the first paragraph. And I have no real quarrel with that in a sense. What I have a quarrel with is the in inferences that are drawn, having been planted already by the culture, to be triggered off, to certain prejudices to be triggered off. Because here's the thing, I'm a Catholic. No problem, I have no, uh, absolutely no shame. Uh, it's not a secret. Uh, about that. It means certain things to me. It doesn't mean what it means to people in the Irish Times, but it means certain things. It means a lot of things. During the referendum, I was, I was called by a journalist from Germany, and she said, well, I'm doing an article um, about the amendment, and I want to talk to both sides, and I hear you're against it. So I said, yes, I am. And she said, I, she said can you tell me why? I said, yes. So I started to talk immediately about the Constitution and the various changes that were, would, the implications, the, 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 the rights which were unenumerated but which were real, which would be changed, the meanings of words, natural and so on, moral and so on. And then she interrupted me. Yes, but you're a Catholic, aren't you? And I said, ah, I see, I see where you're coming from. Now, that's, that's a trick question, in a way. But I understand, it's a, trick, it's a question you can't get out of, because, of course, the answer can only be yes, if it is. And yet, it's not that simple. So I said to her, yeah, I, I see what you mean. But let me put it this way. Yes, there is a connection between my position on this amendment and my Catholicism. But it's not the one you're inferring. It's something like this, that in my experience as a human person over my life, I have tried to interrogate my experience, to examine my experience, uh, and where I have seemed to run into trouble, to analyse the reasons for it. And out of that experience and that uh, the kind of analysis, I developed a certain view of my human structure, where its limits lie, what are the consequences if I breach those limits, and so on. 
And the Catholic Church, to history, has conducted a similar inquiry on behalf of mankind in general. Now, today, I said, you know, I could give you roughly three categories under which, you know, I have a particular relationship with the Church's teaching on different things. Category, category one, let's say it's issues on which I have more or less arrived at the same position as the Church and accept it and, I, and can implement it in my life. Category two, not quite so good. I've understood the Church's teaching, but I'm still struggling against it in my own life. I'm, I'm not able to fully accept it in my own life. And Catholicism allows for this. And three, is ca a category in which teachings which I still haven't understood and haven't been able to incorporate into my own life fully and which I, in a sense, fight against, argue against in my own head. But still, I have a f strange feeling, based on my previous experiences under the other two categories, that one day the penny will drop. And I say, ah, now I see what they mean. Because now my life will have really caught up with this idea. And my experience will have actually gelled with the teaching. That's my experience of Catholicism. And she said, OK, uh, I'll call you back. <laughs> she still hasn't called, but I'm sure she will. <laughs> See, this is the problem. There is a problem here. And the problem is this, that somehow it has got out into the culture, spread by this propaganda, that the objection which people who call themselves Catholic have to, this, to these questions, certain categories, have to do with a pretty joyless ideological, theological position uh, which is enforced by the Vatican for relatively arbitrary and, uh, you, know, in, you know, unconvincing reasons. Reasons basically to do with power and control. Um, so that's what you're fighting when you open your mouth and you can be identified as a Catholic. Now those of us who have tried to uh, look at all these issues, we know that that couldn't be further from the truth. That is not what most Catholics are intent upon. They're intent upon discovering how it is and learning how it is that we should live. That to me is what Christianity is about. It's a tricky thing to describe because we're talking in a secular culture, in a secular language, a language that has been given to us by secularism. So it's inevitable that we will trip across ourselves in attempting to express these things. I could say different things about this. I could say that what we're talking about here are not Catholic truths, they're anthropological truths. But they're also Catholic truths. And they're Catholic truths for precisely the reason that I have outlined, because the church has investigated them and found them to be true, and carried that wisdom through the, the ages as the sole carrier, the sole repository now of these truths about human nature. And for that reason, they are Catholic truths, but they're also anthropological truths. And if I could put it like this, that even if Christ had never come, these things would still be true. But he did come, and they're true. And being a Christian means to speak those truths for me. So there is that connection. And the deeper connection is this one, that if you are a Christian, and going back to the Catechism, first question in the Catechism we learned when we were doing our First Communion was who made the world? And the answer was God made the world. And I often say when I speak in public this, this answer is either true or it's not true. So it's A, true. B, not true. There's no C. We have to decide is it true or not? And if it's not true then let's go home. Because there's nothing to control anything, anything that human beings want to do. There's, not, there's no law in the sense of law written in the man, heart of man or in a book. But if it's true, then there's no such thing as a secular reality and a religious reality. They're one. This is the point. So when we take, talk about Catholic and, uh, and uh, anthropological, they're one. They're one truth. Because if God made the world, whatever God is, whoever God is, I, I'm not talking about a man sitting in a cloud, at this moment, looking down. But I'm talking about an idea of a generation, process of generation, to which we belong, of which we are the creatures. Mm -hmm.
And if that is the case, then everything is generated out of that. And the truth is everything that is contained in that logic. And therefore it is not possible to be a Christian and not to bear witness to those truths. Thank you. Thank you.